Chapter 61 Daenerys When the battle was done, Danny rode her silver through the fields of the dead. Her handmaids and the men of her cos came after, smiling and jesting among themselves. Dothraki hooves had torn the earth and trampled the rye and lentils into the ground, while the rocks and arrows had sown a terrible new crop and watered it with blood. Dying horses lifted their heads and screamed at her as she rode past. Wounded men moaned and prayed. Jakaran moved among them, the mercy men with their heavy axes, taking a harvest of heads from the dead and dying alike. After them would scurry a flock of small girls, pulling arrows from the corpses to fill their baskets. Last of all, the dogs would come sniffing, lean and hungry, the feral pack that was never far behind the Kalasar. The sheep had been dead longest. There seemed to be thousands of them, black with flies, arrow shafts bristling from each carcass. Calogo's riders had done that, Danny knew. No man of Drogo's Kalasar would be such a fool as to waste his arrows on sheep when there were shepherds yet to kill. The town was afire, black plumes of smoke roiling and tumbling as they rose into a hard blue sky. Beneath broken walls of dried mud, riders galloped back and forth, swinging their long whips as they herded the survivors from the smoking rubble. The women and children of Ogo's Kalasar walked with a sullen pride, even in defeat and bondage. They were slaves now, but they seemed not to fear it. It was different with the townsfolk. Danny pitied them. She remembered what terror felt like. Mothers stumbled along with blank, dead faces, pulling sobbing children by the hand. There were only a few men among them, cripples and cowards and grandfathers. Sir Jorah said the people of this country named themselves the Lazarine, but the Dothraki called them Heishrachi, the Lamb Men. Once Danny might have taken them for Dothraki, for they had the same copper skin and almond-shaped eyes. Now they looked alien to her, squat and flat-nosed, their black hair cropped unnaturally short. They were herders of sheep and eaters of vegetables, and Cal Drogo said they belonged south of the river bend. The grass of the Dothraki Sea was not meant for sheep. Danny saw one boy bolt and run for the river. A rider cut him off and turned him, and the others boxed him in, cracking their whips in his face, running him this way and that. One galloped behind him, lashing him across the buttocks until his thighs ran red with blood. Another snared his ankle with a lash and sent him sprawling. Finally, when the boy could only crawl, they grew bored of the sport and put an arrow through his back. Sir Jorah met her outside the shattered gate. He wore a dark green surcoat over his mail. His gauntlets, greaves, and great helm were dark gray steel. The Dothraki had mocked him for a coward when he donned his armor, but the knight had spit insults right back in their teeth. Tempers had flared, longsword had clashed with a rock, and the rider whose taunts had been the loudest had been left behind to bleed to death. <clears throat> Sir Jorah lifted the visor of his flat-topped great helm as he rode up. Your lord husband awaits you within the town. Drogo took no harm? A few cuts, Sir Jorah answered. Nothing of consequence. He slew two cows this day. Kalogo first, and then the son, Fogo, who became Kal when Ogo fell. His blood riders cut the bells from their hair, and now Kal Drogo's every step rings louder than before. Ogo and his son had shared the high bench with her lord husband at the naming feast where Viserys had been crowned, but that was in Vastothrak, beneath the Mother of Mountains, where every rider was a brother and all quarrels were put aside. It was different out in the grass. Ogo's Kalasar had been attacking the town when Cal Drogo caught him. She wondered what the lamb men had thought when they first saw the dust of their horses from atop those cracked mud walls. Perhaps a few, the younger and more foolish who still believed that the gods heard the prayers of desperate men, took it for deliverance. Across the road, a girl no older than Danny was sobbing in a high, thin voice as a rider shoved her over a pile of corpses, face down, and thrust himself inside her. Other riders dismounted to take their turns. That was the sort of deliverance the Dothraki brought the lamb men. I am the blood of the dragon, Daenerys Targaryen reminded herself as she turned her face away. She pressed her lips together and hardened her heart and rode on toward the gate. 
Most of Ogo's riders fled, Sir Jorah was saying. Still, there may be as many as ten thousand captives. Slaves, Danny thought. Cal Drogo would drive them down river to one of the towns on Slaver's Bay. She wanted to cry, but she told herself that she must be strong. This is war. This is what it looks like. This is the price of the Iron Throne. I've told the Kali ought to make for Marine, Sir Jorah said. They'll pay a better price than you'd get from a slaving caravan. Illyrio writes that they had a plague last year, so the brothels are paying double for healthy young girls and triple for boys under ten. If enough children survive the journey, the gold will buy us all the ships we need and hire men to sail them. Behind them, the girl being raped made a heart-rending sound, a long, sobbing wail that went on and on and on. Danny's hand clenched hard around the reins, and she turned the silver's head. Make them stop, she commanded Sir Jorah. Khaleesi? The knight sounded perplexed. You heard my words, she said. Stop them! She spoke to her Kos in the harsh accents of Dothraki. Jogo, Quaro, you will aid Sir Jorah. I want no rape. The warriors exchanged a baffled look. Sir Jorah spurred his heart horse closer. Princess, he said, you have a gentle heart, but you do not understand. This is how it has always been. Those men have shed blood for the cow. Now they claim their reward. Across the road, the girl was still crying, her high sing-song tongue strange to Danny's ears. The first man was done with her now, and a second had taken his place. "'She's a lamb girl,' Quaro said in Dothraki. "'She's nothing, Khaleesi. The riders do her honor. The lamb men lay with sheep. It is known.' "'It is known,' her handmaid eerie echoed. "'It is known,' agreed Jogo, astride the tall gray stallion that Drogo had given him. If her wailing offends your ears, Khaleesi, Jogo will bring you her tongue, he drew his arak. I will not have her harmed, Danny said. I claim her. Do as, you com do as I command you, or Cal Drogo will know the reason why. Aye, Khaleesi, Jogo replied, kicking his horse. Quaro and the others followed his lead, the bells in their hair chiming. Go with them, she commanded Sir Jorah. As you command. The knight gave her a curious look. You are your brother's sister in truth. Viserys? She did not understand. No, he answered. Rhaegar. He galloped off. Danny heard Jogo shout. The rapers laughed at him. One man shouted back. Jogo's arak flashed and the man's head went tumbling from his shoulders. Laughter turned to curses as the horsemen reached for weapons. But by then, Quaro and Ago and Ricaro were there. She saw Ago point across the road to where she sat upon her silver. The riders looked at her with cold, black eyes. One spat. The others scattered to their mounts, muttering. All the while, the man atop the lamb girl continued to plunge in and out of her, so intent on his pleasure that he seemed unaware of what was going on around him. Sir Jorah dismounted and wrenched him off with a mailed hand. The Dothraki went sprawling in the mud bounced up with a knife in hand, and died with Ago's arrow through his throat. Mormont pulled the girl off the pile of corpses and wrapped her in his blood-spattered cloak. He led her across the road to Danny. What do you want done with her? The girl was trembling, her eyes wide and vague. Her hair was matted with blood. Doria, see to her hurts. You do not have a rider's look. Perhaps she will not fear you. The rest with me. She urged the silver through the broken wooden gates. It was worse inside the town. Many of the houses were afire, and the Jaka Ran had been about their grisly work. Headless corpses filled the narrow, twisty lanes. They passed other women being raped. Each time Danny reined up, sent her cost to make an end of it, and claimed the victim as slave. One of them, a thick-bodied, flat-nosed woman of forty years, blessed Danny haltingly in the common tongue. But from the others, she got only flat, black stares. They were suspicious of her, she realized with sadness, afraid that she had saved them for some worse fate. "'You cannot claim them all, child,' Sir Jorah said the fourth time they stopped, while the warriors of her cos herded her new slaves behind her. "'I am Khaleesi, heir to the Seven Kingdoms, the blood of the dragon,' Danny reminded him. 
It is not for you to tell me what I cannot do. Across the city, a building collapsed in a great gout of fire and smoke, and she heard distant screams and the wailing of frightened children. They found Caldrogo seated before a square windowless temple with thick mud walls and a bulbous dome like some immense brown onion. Beside him was a pile of heads taller than he was. One of the short arrows of the lamb men stuck through the meat of his upper arm, and blood covered the left side of his bare chest like a splash of paint. His three blood riders were with him. Jeekwe helped Danny dismount. She had grown clumsy as her belly grew larger and heavier. She knelt before the call. My son in stars is wounded. The Iraq cut was wide but shallow. His left nipple was gone, and a flap of bloody flesh and skin dangled from his chest like a wet rag. Is scratch, moon of life, from a rock of one blood rider to Calogo, Caldrogo said in the common tongue. I kill him for it, and Ogo too. He turned his head, the bells in his braid ringing softly. Is Ogo you hear, and Fogo his Kalaka, who was Carl when I slew him? No man can stand before the son of my life, Danny said the father of the stallion who mounts the world. A mounted warrior rode up and vaulted from his saddle. He spoke to Hago, a stream of angry Dothraki too fast for Danny to understand. The huge blood rider gave her a heavy look before he turned to his cow. This one is Mago, who rides in the Kas of Kaojakuo. He says the Khaleesi has taken his spoils, a daughter of the lambs who was his to mount. Cal Drogo's face was still and hard, but his black eyes were curious as they went to Danny. Tell me the truth of this, moon of my life, he commanded in Dothraki. Danny told him what she had done, in his own tongue, so that Cal would understand her better, her words simple and direct. When she was done, Drogo was frowning. This is the way of war. These women are our slaves now. To do with as we please. It pleases me to hold them safe, Danny said, wondering if she had dared too much. If your warriors would mount these women, let them take them gently and keep them for wives. Give them places in the Kalasar and let them bear you sons. Kotho was ever the crudest of the blood riders. It was he who laughed. Does the horse breathe with the sheep? Something in his tone reminded her of Viserys. Danny turned on him angrily. The dragon feeds on horse and sheep alike. Caldrogo smiled. See how fierce she grows, he said. It is my son inside her, this stallion who mounts the world, filling her with his fire. Ride slowly, Kotho. If the mother does not burn you where you sit, the son will trample you into the mud. And you, Mago. Hold your tongue and find another lamb to mount. These belong to my Khaleesi. He started to reach out a hand to Daenerys, but as he lifted his arm, Drogo grimaced in sudden pain and turned his head. Danny could almost feel his agony. The wounds were worse than Sir Jorah had led her to believe. Where are the healers? she demanded. The Khalasar had two sorts, barren women and eunuch slaves. The herb women dealt in potions and spells, the eunuchs in knife, needle, and fire. Why do they not attend the cow? The cow sent the hairless men away, Khaleesi, old Kaholo answered her. Danny saw the blood rider had taken a wound himself, a deep gash in his left shoulder. Many riders are hurt, Cal Drogo said stubbornly. Let them be healed first. This arrow is no more than the bite of a fly. This little cut... Only a new scar to boast of to my son. Danny could see the muscles in his chest where the skin had been cut away. A trickle of blood ran from the arrow that pierced his arm. It is not for Cal Drogo to wait, she proclaimed. Jogo, seek out these eunuchs and bring them here at once. Silver lady, a woman's voice said behind her. I can help the great rider with his hurts. Danny turned her head. The speaker was one of the slaves she had claimed, the heavy, flat-nosed woman who had blessed her. The cow needs no help from women who lie with sheep, 
barked Kotho. Ago cut out her tongue! Ago grabbed her hair and pressed a knife to her throat. Danny lifted a hand. No, she is mine. Let her speak. Ago looked from her to Kotho. He lowered his knife. I meant no wrong, fierce riders. The woman spoke Dothraki well. The robes she wore had once been the lightest and finest of woolens, rich with embroidery, but now they were mud-caked and bloody and ripped. She clutched the torn cloth of her bodice to her heavy breasts. I have some small skill in the healing arts. Who are you? Danny asked her. I am named Miri Mazdur. I am God's wife of this temple. Magi, grunted Hago, fingering his Iraq. His look was dark. Danny remembered the word from a terrifying story that Jeekwe had told her one night by the cook fire. A Magi was a woman who lay with demons and practiced the blackest of sorceries, a vile thing, <clears throat> evil and soulless, who came to men in the dark of night and sucked the life and strength from their bodies. I am a healer, Miri Mazdur said. A healer of sheeps, sneered Kotho. Blood of my blood, I say, kill this Magi and wait for the hairless men. Danny ignored the blood rider's outburst. This old, homely, thick-bodied woman did not look like a Magi to her. Where did you learn your healing, Miri Mazdur? My mother was God's wife before me, and taught me all the songs and spells most pleasing to the great shepherd and how to make the sacred smokes and ointments from leaf and root and berry. When I was younger and more fair, I went in caravan to a shy by the shadow to learn from their mages. Ships from many lands came to a shy, so I lingered long to study the healing ways of distant peoples. A moon singer of the Jogos Nai gifted me with her birthing songs. A woman of your own writhing people taught me the magics of grass and corn and horse. And a master from the sunset lands opened a body for me and showed me all of the secrets that hid beneath the skin. Sir Jorah Mormont spoke up. The maester? Marwyn, he named himself, the woman replied in the common tongue. From the sea, beyond the sea, the seven lands, he said, sunset lands where men are iron and dragons rule. He taught me this speech. The maester in a shy, Sir Jorah mused. Tell me, God's wife, what did this Marwyn wear about his neck? A chain so tight it was like to choke him, Iron Lord, with links of many metals. The knight looked at Danny. Only a man trained in the citadel of Old Town wears such a chain, he said. And such men do know much of healing. Why should you want to help my call? All men are one flock, or so we are taught, replied Miri Mazdur. The great shepherd sent me to earth to heal his lambs, wherever I might find them. Kotho gave her a stinging slap. We are no sheep, Magi. Stop it, Danny said angrily. She is mine. I will not have her harmed. Cal Drogo grunted. The arrow must come out, Kotho. Yes, great rider, Miri Mazdur answered, touching her bruised face. And your breast must be washed and sewn, lest the wound fester. Do it then, Cal Drogo commanded. Great rider, the woman said, my tools and potions are inside the god's house, where the healing powers are strongest. I will carry you blood of my blood, Hago offered. Cal Drogo waved him away. I need no man's help, he said in a voice proud and hard. He stood unaided, towering over them all. A fresh wave of blood ran down his breast, from where Ogo Zarak had cut off his nipple. Danny moved quickly to his side. I am no man, she whispered, so you may lean on me. Drogo put a huge hand on her shoulder. She took some of his weight as they walked toward the Great Mud Temple. The three blood riders followed. Danny commanded Sir Jorah and the warriors of her cost to guard the entrance and make certain no one set the building afire while they were still inside. They passed through a series of anterooms into the high central chamber under the onion. 
Faint light shone down through the hidden windows above. A few torches burnt smokily from sconces on the walls. Sheepskins were scattered across the mud floor. There, Miri Mazdur said, pointing to the altar, a massive blue-veined stone carved with images of shepherds and their flocks. Caldrogo lay upon it. The old woman threw a handful of dried leaves onto a brazier, filling the chamber with fragrant smoke. Best if you wait outside, she told the rest of them. We are blood of his blood, Koholo said. Here we wait. Kotho stepped close to Mirima's door. Know this, wife of Lamb God. On the call and you suffer the same. He drew his skinning knife and showed her the blade. She will do no harm. Danny felt she could trust this old, plain-faced woman with her flat nose. She had saved her from the hard hands of her rapers, after all. If you must stay, then help, Miri told the blood riders. The great rider is too strong for me. Hold him still while I draw the arrow from his flesh. She let the rags of her gown fall to her waist as she opened a carved chest and busied herself with bottles and boxes, knives and needles. When she was ready, she broke off the barbed arrowhead and pulled out the shaft, chanting in the sing-song tongue of the Lazarine. She heated a flagon of wine to boiling on the brazier and poured it over his wounds. Caldrogo cursed her, but he did not move. She bound the arrow wound with a plaster of wet leaves and turned to the gash on his breast, smearing it with a pale green paste before she pulled the flap of skin back in place. The cow ground his teeth together and swallowed a scream. The god's wife took out a silver needle and a bobbin of silk thread and began to close the flesh. When she was done, she painted the skin with red ointment, covered it with more leaves, and bound the breast in a ragged piece of lamb skin. You must say the prayers I give you and keep the lamb skin in place for ten days and ten nights, she said. There will be fever and itching and a great scar when the healing is done. Caldrogo sat, bells ringing. I sing of my scars, sheep woman. He flexed his arm and scowled. Drink neither wine nor the milk of the poppy, she cautioned him. Pain you will have, but you must keep your body strong to fight the poison spirits. I am Kal, Drogo said. I spit on pain and drink what I like. Koholo, bring my vest. The old man hastened off. Before... Danny said to the ugly Lazarine woman. I heard you speak of birthing songs. I know every secret of the bloody bed, Silver Lady. Nor have I ever lost a babe, Miri Mazdur replied. My time is near, Danny said. I would have you attend me when he comes, if you would. Caldrogo laughed. Moon of my life, you do not ask a slave. You tell her. She will do as you command. He jumped down from the altar. Come, my blood. The stallion's call. This place is ashes. It is time to ride. Hago followed the cow from the temple, but Kotho lingered long enough to favor Miri Mazdur with a stare. Remember, Megai, as the cow fares, so shall you. As you say, rider, the woman answered him, gathering up her jars and bottles. The great shepherd guards the flock.